Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. We're going to be in Romans 15, which is really a continuation, at least in the first verses, of Romans 14, which I think is the greatest chapter in all the Bible on how do we do Christianity in our culture. Because there are some terribly hard questions to deal with. The same basic theological pattern that set the stage for chapter 14, and that is that we do not push our rights, we push our responsibility, because that's what Jesus did, is the same pattern in, ver in chapter 15. Now, it's obvious that there was a real tension between Jews and Gentiles in the early churches. And apparently the legalism of Judaism and the freedom of paganism really clashed as they came in the church. Now, we probably don't have the problem today of Jew versus Gentile, but we certainly do have the tension between Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Roman Catholic, Greek, Orthodox. And that's, that tension, too, how do we live with that? In the larger church of Jesus Christ, how do we deal with brothers who disagree with us? And in local churches, where there's such a multiplicity of opinions on gray areas of the Bible, how do we deal with them? Well, I want to tell you, my friend, this, these two chapters combined give us some very godly, practical guidelines on how to treat our brothers and sisters who don't agree with us. Now, we're not talking about full-blown heretics. And we're not talking about those who violate the obvious black and white standards of the Word of God. That is not who we're talking about. But what about Christians who honestly disagree on certain passages or certain practices or certain uh, uh, events or, or on and on? How do we deal with that? Well, our attitude is the key. Let's look at it. It is the duty of us who are strong. Notice Paul links himself with a strong, which means he has a mature conscience. Now, we've talked about the word conscience. Conscience is something that God gives to every believer. We see it in Romans 1, about 20, 19 and 20, and in Romans 2, 14 and 15, that every person has, sees something of God in nature and has an innate uh, sense of right and wrong. But the problem with an innate sense of right and wrong is it can be conditioned by culture and it can be uh, <laughs> damaged by repeated uh, abuse. And so it's a Holy Spirit-led conscience that we want. And that's what Paul's going to try to give to us, okay? Notice, to bear the weaknesses of those who are not strong. The word to bear here, you might want to see Galatians 6, 2, where it's a good example about a brother who sinned, how we deal with them. This is not dealing with sin. It's dealing with difference of opinion on personality types and personal experiences and backgrounds and all of that. Now, notice it says, and not merely to please ourselves. That is so often the goal of our Christian lives. We are free. Man, Jesus made us really free. That's the universal truth repeated so often in chapter 14. All things are clean. But when we come to Jesus who accepted us with all of our sins and all of our problems and all of our biases and all of our hang-ups and He just accepted us fully and wiped the slate clean, because He's done that for us, we're going to have to do it for our Christian brother and sister. We're not going to push our rights. I have a sermon that I do about the home on Ephesians 5, 21 and following that I entitle, In Love, Rights Become Wrong. And I think that's true here. In the churches, in the churches, our attitude, our judgment, our criticism, our backbiting, our putting people down, not because of certain scripture texts, because of certain cultural denominational tendencies or idiosyncrasies, is a sign not of maturity, not of maturity, but of childlikeness. Now, notice it says, Each one of us must practice pleasing his neighbor. Now, isn't that what Paul did in 1 Corinthians 9, 20-23, where he said, I become all things to all men that I might win some. To the Jew, I become a Jew. To the Gentile... Now, he didn't compromise any uh, important spiritual truths. He wasn't any less a bold proclaimer of the truth. He just didn't push certain things in certain areas. We need to not be so nitpicking and want everybody to agree with us and to act like we do. And We're never going to have that. We need to hold to the essentials of the Christian gospel and allow for freedom in the peripheral gray areas. Okay? Now, notice where it mentions, to, uh, to help in this immediate upbuilding of his eternal good. Our goal in Christian brothers ought to be to his best, not ours. Uh, his advantage, not ours. Y'all see Philippians 2.3. 
Now, this upbuilding is a central theme. It's the central theme of the test for spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Does it edify the church? It's the central theme of Romans 14 in verses 16 and 19 where that ought to be the goal of how we act is the up, not personal rights and freedoms, but the edification of others. Now, you see how Christ like that is when you look at the pattern of his life and that's what he's going to come to. Christ certainly did not please himself. Uh, the example of Jesus here and in Philippians chapter 2 where it says, Let this mind also be in you that was in Christ Jesus. The humility idea. That's what we're supposed to follow Christ's example. Now, in, in uh, let's see, verse 3 is a quote of Scripture. And it's an Old Testament verse. It's Psalm 69, 9, which is basically a messianic reference to where the Messiah set the example of accepting outcast people. And I, I think that is a beautiful thing uh, that we ought to hear. Uh, everything that was written in earlier times was written for our instruction so that by patient endurance and through the encouragement of scriptures we might continuously cherish our hope. Well, this is a very important verse. This tells us that the Old Testament has a valid contemporary purpose in our lives. Another place you might want to see that is 1 Corinthians 10, 6 and 11. That means that even though the history of Israel, we must interpret it as a history of Israel, we can't spiritualize it in a New Testament truth it still is written for our encouragement. Uh, the examples that God dealing with men and God dealing with nations is consistent with the pattern that's set forth in a gracious God dealing with fallen men. And that's why it's applicable uh, to our lives. Now, when it says our hope, usually in the New Testament, when it says hope, it refers to the second coming. Now, it's not the English use of the word hope that means maybe, could be, possibly, it is the Greek idea of the certainty of the event with an ambiguous time element. And that's the ideal here. Do you mean that somehow the Old Testament example and the nearness of the second coming may be an impetus for us to live for Christ? Yes. Just as Christ patterned for us, the Old Testament scriptures, the, the possibility that anyone will return to the Lord, all of those give us encouragement to lay down our rights and to pick up others' best. May God, who gives men patient endurance and encouragement, grant you. Now, here's Paul's prayer for this Roman church. Remember, he didn't start this church. He had never met them. This whole doctrinal section, one through the middle of this chapter, is kind of his uh, statement of faith. Uh, what he believes, setting the stage for his visit there. I think it's so significant because it's the only book that I know that's not... Uh, colored by a local situation or need. It's a systematic theology. It's written toward the end of Paul's life where he had had time to think through the truths he had been learning and proclaiming all those years, those missionary journeys. I want to tell you, I love the book of Romans. There's no other book in the New Testament as far as the theology. Man, you understand Romans. You got the good news. You got it. Now, here's the three things. They live in harmony. You see it there uh, in verse 5. They live in accordance with the standard of Jesus Christ and that with united hearts and lips they may praise God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. What a beautiful prayer for any church. Now, we don't need uniformity, my friend. That's been the problem between Jew and Gentile or denominations or whatever, personality types and all. We don't need uniformity. But, oh God, how we need unity in the love and purpose of Jesus Christ. Oh, how churches need harmony. Hearts knit together following the Lord's example. He prays that for this church. Now, the church at Rome was probably mostly Gentiles, but there was a small Jewish element. Notice where it says, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the full title of God. Let me give you a few places where that's used. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 9, 3, Ephesians 1, 3, and 1 Peter 1, 3. It's used in benedictions, I mean, in, in opening praises many times. Now, Lord Jesus Christ, as you know, this refers to the three different categories that we put Jesus in. Lord is used by New Testament authors for his deity. It's the Old Testament name for a, a God that was applied to him by the Jews so they wouldn't take Yahweh, his covenant name, in vain. So they pronounced the word Adonai, or Lord. Now, the word Jesus means Yahweh saves, given by the angel, Matthew 1, 21. And it is used in the sense of the humanity of Jesus of Nazareth by the New Testament authors. Now, the word Christ is the Greek equivalent of the Old Testament term, the Messiah, which means the anointed one, the specially equipped, specially a chosen one. Therefore, practice receiving one another into full Christian fellowship. Now, look at chapter 14, 1. We're not to say, well, 
You're really not what we wanted. You're kind of a weird, but we'll, we'll take you in here if you just don't say anything. Oh, no. We're to receive them into full Christian fellowship. And 14.1 says, without arguing over disputable points. We're not to make them like us. We're to accept them because Jesus accepted us. Now, then he continues, Yes, I mean that Christ has become a servant to Israel, to the circumcised. Why? Well, Matthew 15, 24, Jesus said, I've come to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus came to do two primary things as far as, as this chapter here. Well, number one was to fulfill the promises to the Jewish people. And number two, to open the eyes of the Jewish people to the promises that have always been in the Old Testament about the inclusion of the Gentiles. Now, in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2 and 3, it's called the secret that was hidden from the ages. And that is that Jew and Gentile will be one in Jesus Christ and form a brand new third entity. Not Jew, not Gentile, but the church. That's been the secret used consistently throughout the New Testament. Okay? Now, notice where it says, Yes, I... I... Yes, I mean that Christ has become a servant to Israel to prove God's truthfulness or truth of God, to make valid His promises to our forefathers, and for the heathen people to praise God for His mercy, as the Scripture says. Now, Israel, or let's go back already in that. Abraham was called to choose a nation, to choose a world. But man's sinfulness got in the way. The Jews turned inward instead of outward. God calls us individually through Jesus Christ to form a body of believers that will be a kingdom of priests to win the world to God. God's heart beats for a lost world. He doesn't choose some and not choose others. He chooses men in Jesus Christ. And then He gives men the awesome responsibility of sharing the good news with others. In a series of Old Testament quote here, Paul the rabbi to a Jewish congregation who was kicking and screaming at the inclusion of these wild-eyed Gentiles shows them that it's always been God's plan that they be a part of the covenant people. He quotes Psalms 1849. He quotes Deuteronomy 32:43. Quotes Psalms 117:1. Quotes Isaiah 11 verse 1 and 10. Now, to a Jew, that would clinch it. God loves Gentile people. Verse 13. May the hope-inspiring God so fill you with perfect joy and peace that through your continuing faith, notice perseverance, that you may bubble, oh, this is Paul's favorite uh, non-grammatical title, super abundantly, <laughs> with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, boy, what a tremendous close for the doctrinal section of the book of Romans. Now, in verses 14 and following, is Paul's personal plans led to the missionary endeavor and to his travel plans for who he wants to preach the gospel to next. Okay? As far as I'm concerned about you, my brothers, I am convinced that you especially are ab abiding in the highest goodness. Very tactful, isn't he? Richly supplied with perfect knowledge and competent accounts. One of the Paul's saying, I'm not coming to you to correct what you don't have. I'm coming to join in with the superbness that you already have in Jesus Christ. And yet to refresh your memories, I have written you rather freely on some details because of the unmerited favor shown by me by God. Now, Paul's going back over the whole book. He's saying, the reason for this book, Romans, is not that you need this, but I just want to remind you of the major truths, the major things that hold us together, that will pull us back together. Okay, now notice in verse 16, a new metaphor is going to be begun. A metaphor that some have criticized because of its uh, <laughs> connection with the Old Testament priestly system. Paul views himself as a priest that is offering the Gentiles as an acceptable, soothing sacrifice to God. He sees himself ministering on their behalf and offering them up to God as a soothing aroma. Now, that's a beautiful picture. The word minister here used in verse 16 and down again in verse uh, 27, in my, my translation, to serve them, this is the word we get the English liturgy from. It's used of a priest before the altar. It's used of Jesus Christ in Hebrews 8, 2. And that it's Paul sees himself as a priest offering the Gentiles to God. Um, to have set me as a sacrificing minister of the good news in order that I may offer 
uh, that my offering of the heathen peoples to God may be acceptable, consecrated by the Holy Spirit. Well, that's what made him acceptable. It wasn't circumcision that made him acceptable. It wasn't being, quote, the chosen people that made them acceptable. It's the fact they were consecrated by the Holy Spirit. That's what made them acceptable. And notice we have the triune God here. We've got God and the Holy Spirit mentioned in verse 16. We've got God again in verse 17. Christ in verse 18. The Holy Spirit in verse 19. Paul often puts the triune God as he acts cooperatively in the salvation and redemption of lost men and the maturing in Christ's likeness of saved men. Uh, of the things that I have done for God, verse 17. This is a Jewish liturgical term. You might want to see Hebrews 2.17, Hebrews 5.1. For I would venture to mention only that Christ has accomplished through me in bringing the heathen peoples to obedience by the word and by work, by the power of signs and wonders and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Notice the threefold. The instrumentality of Paul, the supernatural confirmation of signs and wonders, but the ultimate power, it was the Holy Spirit. And so there's the levels, I think, uh, of the confirmation of the good news. Now, notice where it says... So I have completed the telling of the good news of Christ all the way from Jerusalem around to uh, this, this province here. I hope you'll look at your map. It's on the eastern coast of the Adriatic Sea. We have no mention in the book of Acts or the epistles of Paul going here. Although we have some mention of him being in the region, and it just shows that Acts is not a detailed history, uh, but a theological plan of getting the gospel from, Rome, from Jerusalem to Rome and overcoming national, geographical, and racial barriers. Uh, notice it says, In this manner it has ever been my ambition to tell the good news where Christ's name has never been mentioned. This was Paul's missionary strategy. He wanted to lay the foundation of Christ where no one else has mentioned Christ. You might want to see 1 Corinthians 3.10 and compare that with 2 Corinthians 10.15 and 16. It wasn't arrogance on Paul's part. It was a missionary strategy. We're going to see it later in verse 24 where it relies to his future missionary plans. Now he quotes Isaiah 52.15. I must admit it's somehow out of context. Paul and many of the New Testament writers use the Old Testament in a way that I would feel uncomfortable with. They don't use the historical grammatical method to interpret the Old Testament. But I think they are under a level and degree of inspiration that I could never claim for myself. And so although I see them do that, I would never adopt their practice and assume that God, the Spirit, is leading them to confirm this. And verse 22. Uh, this is the reason why I have so often... Uh, prevented from coming to see you. But now, as there are no more places for me to occupy in this part of the world, Paul saying, I've preached at least representatively in all the places I wanted to, and now i got time to move on to other places, and when I do, I'm going to pass through your town. And as I have many years been longing to come to see you, when I make my trip to Spain, well, did Paul make Spain? Well, I think he really did. Two reasons. The pastoral epistles, 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus, do not fit in the chronology of Acts. I personally believe that Paul was released from prison before Acts ended, I mean after Acts was closed out, and that he had a several year ministry before Nero's death in A.D. 68. I think he probably went to Spain, for in 2nd Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, it is possible instead of Galatia, it's the word Gaul, G-A-U-L, which means southern Spain. Also, Clement of Rome, who wrote before the end of the first century, in his letter to the Corinthians mentions that Paul has gone to the bounds of the West, which seems to imply that Paul made Spain. Um, whether We're not certain, but that seems to be true. And I certainly hope to see you on my way there. Isn't it ironical that Paul certainly made Rome, but it certainly was different from the way he expected, wasn't it? He came in chains. You know, God does things different than we do. But God's power and destiny and provision is on our behalf. Friends, Paul's going to preach in Rome, but it'll be a different way than he expected. Sometimes God does things so different in our lives and we think, oh, this is terrible what's happened to me. I, I bet Paul thought, oh, here I'm in prison. I can't preach. I found in my life that sometimes that which I think is a great blessing, it hadn't been very long until I found out I couldn't handle it, it was probably a great curse. And that which I thought was just a, a destructive note in my life hadn't been very long that I see the hand of God there. And I think, oh God, thank you for that. That's drawn me closer to you. That's been a channel for the spread of the gospel. I think Paul felt that way about making Rome. 
But just now, in verse 25, as I am on my way to Jerusalem to help God's people, it's the word saints. Now, I've said it before, the word saints, I've read the word sanctify or holy. It's those people who were set apart by God, chosen by God, the called out ones. Same as the idea of church, the called out ones. The saints are those who God set His heart on, called them apart. Now, we are saints because of our relationship to Jesus Christ. But hopefully that which is our possession, uh, our position will become our possession. That we not only will be uh, in Christ, we'll be like Christ. And the word saint points toward both of those discussions. Now in verses 26 and following is a discussion of the contribution uh, that was collected by Paul for the poor in Jerusalem. If you'll notice 26, it mentions two geographical areas in Greece, Macedonia and Achaia. Now, we hear of these two areas from 1 Corinthians 16, 1 through 4, and the classical passage, I think the definitive passage on New Testament stewardship, are 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. Now, this idea of a contribution from the Gentile churches for the Jewish church fits right in line with Romans 14 and 15. It's a way of cementing the two groups together, getting them to appreciate each other and love each other. Now, Paul did not start this. It started at the church at Antioch of Syria where he happened to be. We see that from Acts 11.30 and 12.25. And he kept the practice up. And it was a great practice. And he had done it for several years. And here he talks about it here. They certainly were delighted to do it, and they really, uh, and they really are, are under obligation to them for if, first class conditional, assumed to be true, the heathen peoples have shared in their spiritual blessings, they ought to serve, minister them in material blessings. And Paul is there affirming that the Gentile church owe a lot uh, to the Jewish church. And I want to say today, I have a real love for Jewish people. And I think we in the church are obligated to share with them why and how we believe that Jesus is the promised Messiah. Uh, there is a sense that that's very, very important. Now, notice where it mentions here. So after I have finished this matter and made sure of the results of this contribution for them, I shall come by you on the way to Spain. I think Paul knew there's a lot of problems. Uh, the prophet Agabus told him he'd be put in chains, but that's not till he got to Ephesus. I think probably Paul knew there'd be trouble in Jerusalem. He's go in the prayer that follows, he's going to ask that the, that the church at Jerusalem will see that, receive this gift in an appropriate manner. Uh, he knew there was trouble coming, but he had to go to Jerusalem, and then he wanted to come to Rome. Verse 29, And I feel sure that when I come to you, I shall come with Christ's abundant blessing on me. And he certainly did, but what a different way. Now, in 30-33, through 33, Paul requests prayer for himself and his ministries. Listen to what he says. Now I beg you, brothers, for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love the Holy Spirit inspires. Now boy, he's hitting some hard stuff. Because of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, he's saying, pray for me. To wrestle with me in prayers to God on my behalf. And the word wrestle, you know, we get the English word agonize or agony from this. It, it was used of an athletic contest. So we're not talking about praying at our meals. We're talking about a spiritually struggle with me. Uh, for my ministry. This, this is what he says, three things. Number one, verse 31, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who are disobedient. Number two, that the help which I am taking to Jerusalem may be well received by God's people there, the saints, the church. Number three, so that if by God's will I may come with a happy heart to see you and have a refreshing rest while I am with you. Three things, Paul asks. We're not sure about how the church received the gift. We are sure that Paul was not delivered from those who were after his life. But God used it. God told Paul when he called him that he was going to let him speak to the kings of the Gentiles. This was Paul's way, not of just speaking to the church at Rome, but the emperor himself and the praetorian guard and members of the emperor's family. It was God's plan. It was wonderful in his sight. And it was effective. It wasn't Paul's plan. And it wasn't Paul's way because it was hurtful and painful and fearful. And Jesus had to appear to Paul in several visions along the way to say, Paul, I'm in this. Paul, trust me. Oh, friends, how we need that. Our prayers aren't always answered the way we want. But our fellowship with God is sure. And our lives have a purpose. And He will not leave us in a lurch. And we are not on our own resources. Hey, Paul, I hear your prayer. I read the history. 
God said yes, but He said, not this way, son. We'll go another way. And the other way will be better for me and better for you. And then Paul closed with this great prayer he closes so many of his lessons with. The peace-giving God be with you all. Amen. The peace-giving God. The peace-giving God. He says it again in chapter 16, 20. He says it in the very first letters he probably ever wrote. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. 2 Thessalonians 3, 10. Said it in 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Said it in Philippians 4, 9. And he says it here. The peace given God. The prayers weren't answered in the way he thought, but the peace giving God worked it out all right. Even Paul's death in Rome by decapitation. Peace given God was involved with that. It was time to come home. Amen. Amen is the Hebrew word for faith. It is the word that's used in Habakkuk 2.4 that Paul developed so wonderfully in Romans chapter 4. The basic etymology is to be firm or sure. We come to use it in the sense of I agree with you or I affirm that. But originally it meant faithfulness. God, the faithful God, called us. The peace-giving, faithful God called us. He called us in faith and He wants to make us faithful men like Him. And Paul sees that in his life. Now, next week we'll be talking about uh, Romans 16 where Paul says goodbye. Oh, it's a beautiful thing. All the men here and all the women, we never know anything about, but Paul knew them and God knew them. There was a plan for their life and God used them. There's a plan for your life, my friend. I don't know what you're going through, but I want you to know the peace-giving God is with you. Nothing just happens to God's people. The God who is able to bring Christ from the dead is able to do His will in your life. Hang in there. It will be worth it all when we see Him.